for these first presentations. I think it's a good segue into the second part of the, the afternoon um, and also later for our discussion because I think um, both Oli and, and Robert made a very good case as to why it is important to combine um, nutrition and sanitation more. And I think what Juan and I would like to present is some ideas of how that can be done. So in other words, that, that marriage that we're talking about that isn't yet happening on the ground, how could that be made possible? And the, the two case studies that we want to present very quickly because it is work in progress. We're basically not yet married. I mean, he and I are not, <laughs> right. anyway. To other, to other um, people, right? <laughs> yes, that too. But uh, in, terms of, in terms of the work that, um, that we're doing with our colleagues in the health units and in, in, in the World Bank and other institutions, we're very much at the engagement stage. So we're kind of trying to find, set the ground rules that are necessary in order for these two professions to work together at large scale. And I think I want to emphasize the fact that we're looking, we're not looking at a small pilot, we're looking at trying to merge two large scale approaches in a country hopefully to multiply the effect on issues such as malnutrition and stunting. So um, we want to quickly go into this presentation and want to give you a very brief overview of what conditional cash transfers actually are because I don't think a lot of people in the room will have come across these if you're not working um, across your sector with colleagues in either education or nutrition. Conditional cash transfers are by now actually quite a widespread phenomena in many, many countries um, and are key pillars of government anti-poverty programs. They're focusing on providing um, cash grants to poor families to alleviate some of their constraints, um, mostly related to education, health and nutrition. So for example, the family would receive a cash um, grant for, to make sure that their kids have uniforms for school, that they can actually get to school, transport is paid, or that um, for food uh, supplements or vaccinations. And um, as you can see, the word conditional in there means that the cash transfer is given out on, based on a certain condition that that family needs to fulfill. So for example, in Latin America, there, there are many examples where, um, you know, for the education uh, sector, a condition would be your child has to go to school 85% of school days. It has to be verified by the teacher, upon which the family then receives a certain cash grant to make it possible for that child to actually go to school. The cash transfer is usually given out to the female, in almost all cases given out to the female household head directly. And um, the idea is that these are long-term interventions to alleviate poverty. And they have these two objectives, so poverty alleviation, and to also induce a behavioral change. So in the early days, the idea was to get kids from um, working at a very early age into school if cash was the problem, if the additional income of the kid was what the family needed, then you would sort of supplement that and give it to the family so the children can actually start going to school with the assumption that if you do that over an extended period of time, families would not revert back to taking the kid immediately out of school by that, you know, that they would do the same thing with the second child and third child. And um, so these are sort of the, the concept of these traditional cash transfer programs. Some of the questions that are, when, when, when these programs are designed, and they are large scale, we're talking about 15 million people in the Oportunidades program in Mexico, 8 million in the Philippines. So these are large scale um, anti-poverty programs. Some of the key questions that are being asked when these are designed are what are the key constraints by, by the target group, by the poor? What, is, it, is it actually really cash? Is it, is it cost that, that hinders them from doing things in a different way for the next generation? Um, and what would be the subsidy amount that would actually really make a difference um, in order for the family to be able to change? And how can these conditions be monitored? Because a key element of this is appropriate targeting of, um, of those family and monitoring and enforcing uh, the conditions that basically the families um, are signing up to for this. Most of these programs are targeted at families, at, at poor families. There are a few, and one of them I'm using here as well, that are targeting whole communities. So rather than saying we are um, choosing to find the poorest of the poor in all corners of the country. In some countries, this is done at the community level, such as in Indonesia, 
where the government has decided that for the time being it is too difficult, too complicated and too, too prone to corruption to pick individual families. So they're going on a community basis. They're using different data to kind of define that. Um, Juan will just quickly take over to say, why do we care about these programs? Sure. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Yeah, so um, why are we thinking about conditional cash transfer uh, programs for, for sanitation? Uh, the, the first and very obvious reason is that we're not doing that wonderfully well with the, the, the process that we're following at the current time, that you know, traditional financing approaches have not uh, really, I think Robert also alluded to this, and, for example, in uh, India, still 60% open defecation. We, we're looking for, for new techniques and new approaches. Uh, another reason which is quite important is this issue about sanitation is essentially a, a private cost and a public good. And so conditional cash transfers are a way of possibly aligning the incentives properly, so uh, giving people a reason to change their behavior. And also that we've also struggled a little bit in our sanitation programs in being able to deliver support to only those people who, who, who require it. And again, in, uh, in South Asia, we've had a lot of focus on this above poverty line, below poverty line kind of uh, approach, and it's been very difficult to manage that. So we think that conditional cash transfers are one way that we can address this. Um, and uh, you know, other reasons are that um, you know, there is you know, a, a substantial body of evidence which seems to suggest that conditional ca cash transfers are working in terms of changing behaviors, and there's a lot of data showing uh, improvement in consumption and the composition of, of consumption resulting from the introduction of conditional cash transfer programs. And uh, equally, to also to, to build up on some of what Oli was saying as well, we also have a substantive body of evidence and a growing body of ed evidence which suggests that improved hygiene and sanitation is going to improve uh, uh, reducing malnutrition. Okay, so uh, now what's been happening about conditional cash, cash transfers really started in Latin America, most famously in, um, in Brazil and in Mexico in about 2007. Uh, now they spread across the world. So there are about 30 programs uh, underway at the current time. And these have become, in some cases, quite substantial. So the, uh, the Opportunidades program in Mexico is about a $4 billion program. And, for example, in Ecuador, the conditional cash transfer program there represents 1% of GDP, so really quite, quite large. Uh, to date, there is really no conditional cash transfer program focusing on sanitation. It could be argued that the, the Nirmal Gram Paraska program in India has some characteristics of a community conditional cash transfer program, but... Um, it's really probably not, not really there, and particularly if you look at the formal rules of the system, it really isn't. So we're going to talk about a couple of uh, concrete examples. One of them is Peru. Just a little bit of background about Peru. Peru is obviously a, a country that's doing very well, uh, that the, the growth rate is really quite substantial, about 6.9%. Uh, it's also quite an urbanized country, uh, and uh, what we're really are addressing here is that the rural population of Peru is not doing quite as well as the country overall. And as the graph shows, that there is uh, a, a, something of an intractable problem in terms of reducing rural poverty and improving rural sanitation. And th these two things together are also um, supporting a, a significant ongoing problem in terms of, of rural chronic malnutrition. And you know, so that the... Um, the, uh, there's a, a challenge there which the government of Peru is trying, is trying to address. Now, one of the things that they've been doing is that they have a conditional uh, cash transfer program, which is called Juntos. Uh, it's been in place for about six years now, and the, the five or six years, and which is also now quite large, about a quarter percent of GDP. It's covering 700 districts. Uh, it's about half a million people. It's the, with a uh, the idea is that it's going to increase to about 800,000 people uh, in the next few years, um, and it's covering over a quarter of the, the total uh, extreme poor in the country. Already, we're seeing uh, quite positive results from this program. From 2007 to uh, 2010, we saw a reduction in chronic malnutrition from 28.5% to 23.2%. So that's what about a... Uh, 18% reduction in, uh, in chronic malnutrition. So it's really been quite effective. 
Now, as Almud said, we are still in the development stage of uh, introducing sanitation into, into this program. So this is basically what we are uh, developing, that um, working both on the demand side and the supply side. And uh, in terms of why we haven't seen conditional cash transfers and sanitation working together, you can see one of the immediate challenges right up there up front in this, in, the, in, the, in this slide is that it involves two separate ministries, the Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion and the Ministry of Housing and Sanitation, which from kind of a, uh, a uh, history of, of, of working in the World Bank, that is the third rail of development, trying to work with two ministries at the same time. So this is one of the things that we're going to, well, we are now trying to do in, 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 um, in Peru. So basically on the demand side, what it is, is that the families receive a coupon which covers the cost of sanitation, but most important, they also get a post-installation cash incentive for use of sanitation. So on the demand side, that's the structure. On the supply side, um, they're trying to make sure that sanitation equipment is, is available, that the infrastructure is available, uh, but also that there's a, a monitoring and evaluation structure in place, a compliance structure to see that it works. Okay, and so where are we right now? So what we're basically doing, we talked about the intervention strategy in the last slide. Where we are now is really focusing on what are the, the results that we're going to be measuring in terms of hygiene awareness, the, um, in terms of you know, uh, capacity development in the community, uh, and in terms of also making sure sanitation facilities are there. And then what are going to be our intermediate outcomes, uh, you know, increased use of sanitation, that the fact that the household is going to, to have a, uh, a cleaner aspect and that the communities are going to be ODF and ultimately what is the impact that we're working towards which is going to be height for age uh, and in the under twos. So hand back to Almond. Good, very quickly and uh, we'll be just saving the really good details for the discussion later at the table so um, you're all invited to come up. Uh, very quickly, the second example we wanted to give where we're trying to, again, marry this, you know, the nutrition and the sanitation community um, and its working progress is in Indonesia. Um, you don't have to look at all the data. The interesting data is down there. Indonesia still has almost 36% of its children stunted, which is very high um, globally, but it's extremely high for comparing them with um, peer countries. It is a very, very high number, and the government is interested in dealing with that. Um, and wants to tackle this. And um, there is a community conditional cash transfer program different from the one in uh, most of the ones in Latin America. Indonesia had decided to do it at a community basis. So basically, a community as a whole needs to make sure that all their children go to school, for example, 85% of the time, upon which they get a community grant they can use in any way to make sure that that happens. So for example, if the bridge broke down that gets kids to school, they could use the money to build that bridge. And it's all based on community decisions. And within the community, they need to make sure that everybody um, manages to reach that goal. So automatically, more has to be given to the poor um, households in that community. That's the goal behind it. Um, it's, a, it's a program that has been existing for three or four years now, and again, the impact evaluation, these CCT programs have been evaluated through the roof. They have been one of the most um, RCT trial, randomized control trial um, evaluations that I've seen, and they all come out pretty strongly on the nutrition um, side, saying that these programs really have had an in impact on malnutrition, and in, in the Indonesia case, the program came out saying there's really a 10% increase um, in uh, decrease in malnutrition from the baseline and especially pronounced in some of the most um, uh, poverty, high poverty provinces in the country. So they're, and they're, interest, they're interested in expanding that and also making sure that you can have even more of an effect on nutrition. And this is where they came over and said, you know, we, we would be interested now in sanitation. Um, I don't want to give you any details, but the silos indicate a little bit, you know, when, when they first came, they said, oh, we wouldn't do all this, and you guys just do your sanitation and hygiene stuff. And that's some, one of the difficulties that we're finding in actually making sure that we work together is these perceptions of what Robert said of the silos, the nutritionists go to their conferences, we go to ours, we don't talk the same language, we're using the same words but mean something else. Um, the other community thinks all we do is sort of build things and you know you just provide your toilets and then everything will be done. That took a long time to overcome. So I think what the reason we thought it would be an interesting topic to discuss 
um, sort of after we've agreed that the idea of mirroring sanitation and nutrition is important, to discuss how we can get over the devil that is in the detail. This is a very cute devil, but it isn't that cute. It actually is a lot of hard work to make something work at the operational level, in particular if you try to do it at scale with two sort of large-scale programs or two large-scale approaches that are existing and you try to marry these, a lot of it comes down to multi-sectoral co collaboration, common approaches, people looking beyond their usual silos, talking to other departments that they've never talked to. Um, using the right words so that within government this is attractive not only to one sector but to another one. Should it be conditions or should it be incentives? Should you look more at a centralized or decentralized level? Um, do you want to target families? Do you want to target communities? What's the best way of making sure that this works? In the case of Indonesia, we realized at some point that as long as we put any of the words sanitation or nutrition in the title of what we were trying to do, it would automatically go over to that camp. So when we realized th that we, we just had to pull it out completely and call it we want to prevent stunting, and then it was possible to, to, for two different camps to work together, but we just had to make sure this is taken out because the second one of the words were in the other part of the community was no longer interested in working together. Um, so these are some of the things that we've been thinking about, and I think it would be good in the group discussion later to talk about more of these details because at the end of the day, this is where I think it will become very, very interesting, um, rewarding, but also very challenging to make this work at scale in the countries that we work in.